in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2. How many of you have been enjoying our Ephesians series? If you haven't been enjoying it, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> but I've been enjoying the Ephesians series. I've been enjoying digging into God's Word, and it's, it's been a great series. And, and I know that, that this series in Christ, it's, 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 it's a nine-part series. This is week six of this series. And, 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 and I know we've been saying some of the same things over and over again, but you, you, you have to get used to that in Scripture because it says the same thing over and over again. It's all about Jesus, and it's all about his gospel, and it's all about the implications of the gospel. And that's what we see over and over again in the first three chapters of Ephesians. We see what Christ has done. We see in light of what Christ has done, because of our faith in his work, we see who we are in him. And we've seen it over and over again, and we're going to continue to see it. We're going to look at another spiritual blessing. And this is what the Apostle Paul prayed at the beginning of Ephesians. He prayed that we would come to know the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. As believers, what is ours? What do we possess as Christians? And so again, we're going to look in week six of In Christ. You know, our world, our society, and in particular, our American culture, but this is, would be the same for in the other country, but just because we live in Louisiana, we live in Homa in Louisiana, in America, I'm going to speak about our country. You know, our country, our nation, has tried for many, many years to deal with the issue of division among people. And, you know, Division among people comes in many different forms. You have different political parties, and there's division amongst the political parties, and there, there from my estimation, will never be unity amongst the political parties. And then there's divisions in, in, in economic classes of people. There's divisions among races. There's division in churches. There's division all over our society in America, and, and people try hard to bring unity and to bring peace, to bring, to bring reconciliation amongst people, amongst nations, amongst races. And they try in their own strength. They try their own ability. They come up with new strategies and new plans. And I want you to know that it will fail every time. Every attempt at unity amongst people, amongst nations, amongst races in society will fail when it's apart from Christ. It's bound to fail. But why is it bound to fail? Why can we not have unity apart from Christ with other people? Why can we not have unity? Because our world is broken, right? It's broken. Why is, why is our world broken? It's broken because of sin. We live in a sin-cursed world. And I, I just want to start my message with a Bob Dylan song. If you're starting the message, this is a good way to start a message, right? With the Bob Dylan song. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to read the lyrics. Who's ever heard the Bob Dylan song, Everything is Broken? Come on, people. Oh, we got Mr. Gene back there. So I heard everything is broken. I never heard it either, so I'm <laughs> just saying. Everything is broken by Bob Dylan. Broken lines, broken strings. Broken threads, broken springs. Broken idols, broken heads. People sleeping in broken beds. Ain't no use jiving. Ain't no use joking. Everything is broken. Broken bottles, broken plates, broken switches, broken gates, broken dishes, broken parts. Streets are filled with broken hearts. Broken words never meant to be spoken. Everything is broken. Seem like every time you stop and turn around, something else just hit the ground. Broken cutters, broken saws, broken buckles, broken laws, broken bodies, broken bones, broken voices on broken phones. Take a deep breath. Feel like you're choking. Everything is broken. Every time you leave and go off someplace, things fall to pieces in my face. Broken hands on broken plows, broken treaties, broken vows, broken pipes, broken tools, people bending broken rules, hound dog howling, Bullfrog croaking, everything is broken. And that's why things are the way they are in our world. That's why we'll never have unity and peace amongst people apart from Jesus Christ. It, 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 is, no, it is a noble cause to seek unity and peace and reconciliation, to, to, to do away with, with prejudice and racism. It, it, is, it is noble. We should pursue that 
in any way that we can, but ultimately there will never be this side of heaven unity amongst people apart from Christ because everything is broken. And you know, our culture, they, they believe that religion divides us. They think that religion is the problem. It's religion that's the problem. If, if we wouldn't have religion, then, then, then we would have unity. But religion's not the problem. Sin is the problem. Religion is not what divides us. Our brokenness is what divides us. Our sinful nature and the sin that we commit is what divides us. The root cause, listen, the root cause of strife, discord, antagonism, enmity, hate, bitterness, fighting, war, conflict, and every other form of disunity and division is sin. That's the cause. It's sin. Rebellion against God And the sinfulness of people is what divides us. There is only one way, only one way to have genuine peace and unity. There is only one solution for for divisions among men, and that is the removal of sin. And Jesus Christ accomplished that on the cross. He removed sin by taking the punishment of sin that was due us. And now because of faith in Christ, we can have the the, the, the sin of our lives removed and the punishment and the guilt that is on us, we can have it removed through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the heart of what Paul speaks about in Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue here. He speaks to the reality of of divisions among people. And what he's going to deal with here is he's going to deal with the division among Jews and Gentiles. Jews were God's chosen people, right? They were God's special people through the nation of Israel. God brought our Savior, Jesus Christ, and they were set apart by God. And so when Jesus came and lived a sinless life and died a death on a cross and he was resurrected, that that early church was made up of Jews. The early church was made up of Jews, and, 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 and these men and women did not believe that Gentiles were clean. Before Christ came, they, they, they believed that all Gentiles were unclean and you couldn't even have conversations with them. You couldn't eat at, at the dinner table with them. You walked on the opposite side of the street of all non-Jews. And, they, and, and so Paul is uh, going to ad- address the, 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 the division and the disunity, the prejudice and the racism between Jews and Gentiles. And he's going to come at it head on here. So let's look at Ephesians 2 and let's look at the spiritual blessing of unity in Christ. This is the blessing we're going to look at, unity in Christ. Ephesians 2, 11 through 18 says this, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. So what's Paul saying here? The Jews were circumcised. It was a mark on on the outside of of the males of the nation of Israel that would set them apart as being a part of the nation of Israel. And so what he's saying here is he's saying that you, the uncircumcision, you Gentiles who don't have that outward mark of your connection with God, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, do you remember last week, Matt talked about the most, someone most, one of the most powerful word in the New Testament was but God? We see it right here. But now in Christ Jesus, you who, were, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preach peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. This is speaking, those who were near were the Jews, those who were on the outside, not God's chosen people, the Gentiles. They were far off, and it says there, he came and preached peace to those who were far off and those who were near. For through him we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. The foundation of true unity between people starts with 
the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what we want to look at this morning is, is the spiritual blessing of the unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ. And what does that look like practically in our life? What, what do we experience with this unity be, between us as brothers and sisters in Christ? The first thing is this. In Christ, we all have access to the peace of God. In Christ, we all have access to the peace of God. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, 13 through 14. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. By what? By the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. We all have access to the peace of God, and it's through the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, in Christ, we all sing the same song. What song do we sing? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We all sing the same song. You know, there's an old saying that at the, at the, at the, at the, that the, the ground at, at the cross, the, the, the ground at the foot of the cross is what? It's level ground. It's level ground. We all come broken. We all come full of sin. We all come the same way. We all come in need of redemption. And I want you to know that there are no second class Christians. There's no different levels of Christians. Now, some of us may be more mature in the faith because God's had a a little bit more time to work on our on our fleshly nature and to conform us into his image. But we, we are we are all one. There's no second-class citizen in heaven, in God's kingdom. We are all one in Christ. We all say, share the same spiritual blessings. And I, and I, I think that that mindset can be adopted in the church, where, you, where, where it can be believed that, you know, like Pastor Ben, he's just kind of like this superstar guy up there because he's a pastor and he's at a greater level. I am just like you. And any other person that you look at that, that, that you think they're just so super spiritual and they are so elevated above me, it is not true. We are all one in Christ. We all come the same way. We are all in need of God's grace. How many of you know you need God's grace every day? I need it every day to be in my right mind. I need it every day. Though yesterday, those four kids. Look, I, I, talked, to, um, I talked to Brother uh, Manny Vera. Brother Eddie Vera's son, Manny, I texted him yesterday and I asked him, I said, did you survive? Because he was babysitting, I think for the first time, his kids alone, possibly. And he said, he sent me a text back and he said, I'm alive and they're alive. (laughs) I'm alive. And I said, brother, that is the number one goal. When you babysit as a father, just make sure they're alive, they're fed and they're clothed. When your wife gets back, you're good to go. Everything else house doesn't need to be clean. Don't worry about the laundry, right? I need God's grace every day to keep me clothed and in my right mind and focused on what is true and noble and right. We're all that way as believers in Christ. Whether, whether, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're black, whether you're white, it doesn't matter what, what your background is, where you came from. If you came to faith in Jesus Christ, you came the same way. There's only one way to come. And how do you come? You come humbly. You come repentant. You come and you lay yourself down at the foot of the cross and you say, God, take me. I have no other hope. You are my only hope for forgiveness and reconciliation. We all come the same way. And in the book of Acts, what Paul is dealing with here in Ephesians, the Lord had to deal with with the early church. You guys remember the story about Peter and his vision that he had to have? Peter was a Jew. He preached the first New Testament message in the book of Acts chapter 2. And he needed to be reminded or told by God that the gospel was not just for the Jews, that the gospel was for non-Jews. And so God is working with a man named Cornelius. And Cornelius is a Gentile. And the book of Acts says that Cornelius was a God-fearer. He feared the Lord, but he needed to have the revelation of Jesus Christ. He needed to have that special revelation of who Christ is. And so Cornelius was seeking the Lord, and and God gives Cornelius a vision. And God tells Cornelius, there's going to be a man named Peter, and he's going to be in the city of Joppa. And I want you to send three men to go meet Peter and bring Peter to your house. So that's the background there. Then Peter gets a vision around the same time that Cornelius is getting a vision. And let's read Peter's vision, Acts 10, 
12 through 16. In it, in this vision, were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I'm a good Jew. I'm a good Jew. I follow the law. I don't eat anything that is considered unclean. I only eat what is unclean by no means. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, three times. And the, and, and, the, and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. Three times. Can you imagine the third time? Peter's, okay, I get it, Lord. I get it. Acts 10, 19 through 20. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that type of vision? Think about that. How many of you, you'd be like, that's just bad pizza. That's like, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not going anywhere and going with three men that I've never met. But he knew he heard from the Lord. He knew this was a supernatural vision, so he said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go. And so the men were there in Joppa waiting on Peter. Peter says, hey, I'm Peter. Hey, we're here to bring you to Cornelius' house. And they go to Cornelius' house. And look, I just want you to know this is so strange. This is unheard of for a Jew to go into the house of a Gentile to be welcomed in as a guest. Peter would not have done this had it not been for the supernatural vision that God sent to him. And let's listen to what happens here. So Cornelius begins to speak and says, we, we, we want to know about God. We want to know about the way and how to be in right relationship with God. So here is Peter again preaching. He preached in Acts 10, Acts 2, and he preaches in Acts 10. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, say that word with me, anyone, anyone, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. To him, all the prophets, to Christ, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him and Christ receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's through his name that forgiveness of sins come. He's preaching the gospel to these Gentiles. And look what happens, verse 44 through 45. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, among the Jews who had come with Peter, were amazed. They were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. The gospel is for everyone. And it had to, God had to speak to these Jews where the gospel came to first and had to show them that the gospel is not just for you. The gospel is for the entire world. God shows no partiality. We, when we come to the cross, we are all the same. No one is better than anyone else. And at, and at this core, at this place, at this foundation is the hope for unity amongst people, amongst nations, and amongst races. The only hope for peace and unity in a broken world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's, here's where the hope comes from. It's not just that we unify. It's not just that we unify and we say we're all believers, okay, so we're going to unify around that. But here's what happens when you become a believer. When men and women, young and old, surrender to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they become Christians, their view on everything changes. This is what happens. You can have somebody who is prejudiced and racist against a certain particular race or gender or, 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 or a certain type of person, and they come to the, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Their view about all men being created in the image of God impacts them. And they realize, wait a minute, how can I be a Christian and say that anybody else is less than me? That's how the gospel changes everything. That's how true unity is, is going to come. And when we try to have unity apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ transforming the way we see the world, it is a faulty attempt and it will always fail. And men will always be trying. This is what is special about us as a body of, of Christians here at Living Word Church. We get to demonstrate to the world that wherever you come from, if you come to faith in Jesus Christ, that common bond of the gospel unifies us across all different mindsets and understandings. 
because we all surrender to Jesus Christ and his word. Do you guys believe that? That's the foundation of true unity. It's centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 says this, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. In Christ, those who believe, you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ and you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And that's the first thing that we see that Paul is bringing out here, that this dividing wall that brought separation to different races and different nations is broken down because we, from our different backgrounds, come together under the banner of Jesus Christ and under submission to his word. And we have a unity that is precious, a unity that is sacred and holy as believers in Jesus Christ. The second thing that we see is this. We see that in Christ, the dividing wall of hostility is broken down. So in Christ, we all have access to the peace of God. But in Christ, now, this dividing wall of hostility is broken down. Let's go back to the text, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Jesus, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. We come to understand that through the gospel that God shows no favoritism. He shows no partiality. He will pour out his grace lavishly on all those who cling to Christ. This reality is what unifies us as brothers and sisters in Christ. This unity is a spiritual blessing that we can only receive as believers. And But I want you to know that this unity that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ is under attack. The enemy of our soul, Satan, wants to cause us to be not unified, wants to bring disunity amongst us as brothers and sisters in Christ. It is his goal that we would come and we would attend here at Living Word Church and we would find all kinds of reasons to be offended. He wants to bring dissension and disunity and and unforgiveness and bitterness amongst us as brothers and sisters in Christ because because if a kingdom is divided, it can't do what? Can't stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. A church divided against itself cannot stand. And this unity that has been provided through the peace of Jesus Christ and the blood of his cross is a, is a unity to be protected. It's a unity to be guarded with all that we have. What a great precious privilege we have that we can call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. We're family. You guys believe that? We're family. You're my brother. You're my sister. All of you older ones, you're not just my brother and sister. You're my mom. You're my dad. You're my grandpa. You're my grandmother, right? I didn't just say that. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. But it's true, right? It says that the older ones should mentor the younger ones, right? And, and, and that's, that's the beauty of, 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 a, of a family. The older women mentor the younger women. The older men mentor the younger men. We're family. And it's precious. And it's a privilege that we would fight for that. You know, I, I, I just love, I love when we pray for each other down here. I know there's some churches that would see that as, as, as a bother because it, it adds time to the service. I know it's 1126 right now and come Saints season here in a little bit. Some of you are going to be getting antsy right now. But I just want you to know I will never, I will never do away with that prayer time. You can watch, you can DBR the Saints game because there is something special. There is something special about that time. This is not a performance. This is not a show. I don't, I, we don't do this to, to put on church. This is real life. These are real people. Look, I just want you to know something. When we put out that prayer wall right over there behind on that hallway by Hebrews, and we asked you guys to write down your prayer needs, and I promised you that as your pastor that we would every Monday morning open up those prayer requests and read them and pray for them. We have done that every single week. And I want you to know when we read those, some of them don't have names, some of them do. We're reading them. Our hearts are broken. Every Monday when we read those, we think, oh, God, 
these people that are coming in every week. There's cancer. There's no job. There's, there's this child is lost and, and this person is struggling. There's anxiety. There's, there's, there is depression. There's fear. There's worry. There's uncertainty. All the different types of struggles. And you read it over and over again. This is real life. And when we come together once a week on a Sunday, if it takes 15 minutes to pray for the needs because everyone is coming down, amen. We will link arms because this is real life and this is family and this is what family does. We're not here just to check off a religious box. We're here to worship Christ. We're here to connect with each other. We're here to experience real life together, to love each other, to pray for each other. Amen? Tony Merida, Merida says this about the book of Ephesians in this section that we're reading. He says, there was a vertical and horizontal purpose for Christ's death. A vertical and a horizontal purpose. Through the cross, we are not only reconciled to God, but we are also reconciled to others. And I want, you, I, I want to speak to something real quickly here. I just believe that I know that in a church this size, that there is probably division amongst us. There's probably situations in our church where somebody is offended at somebody else. Somebody hurt someone else's feelings, and you are offended, and you're angry at each other right now as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul dealt with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I just want to read this. I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul says here. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that you are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Now apparently in, in Corinth, there was lawsuits amongst brothers, amongst brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Apostle Paul is getting at this point right here. He's saying, listen, listen, the world's already against you. The world is already out to get you, and you're going to take your division and your disunity. Somebody's wronged you, and you're going to take it to the people that are already against you. Shouldn't it be that you should be able to work things out between brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you know why it's challenging? And this is a reality. It, it happens in church. It happens because we're not perfect people. We will offend each other. We will wrong each other. But the reason that some of these things can never be, be overcome is because we don't view this as family. We don't really view it as family. It, it, we, we take the world's mindset into the church, and we, and we take that mindset of, of, of it's, it's all about me, and it's my way, and I'm going to fight for my rights. You know, in the family, you have no rights you're all equal. I'm trying to teach that to my children, right? You're all equal. Your brother is not greater than you. Your sister is not greater than you. Romans, Romans 12, I just love this section. This is, this is what it looks like to be a spirit-filled Christian and, and to fight for unity amongst each other. Romans 12, 9 through 19, let love be genuine. Paul speaking to Christians here. Love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another. How? Brotherly, what, what, what's, what's brotherly affection like? I wish I had my sister here with me. I wish my sister Naomi was here, my older sister. Man, we had some disunity growing up. Oh, my mom is here. I love having my mom at, at church because I, I can use all these examples, and she could attest to that. So if you think I'm fudging the truth, you can talk to her after service. But I have an older sister who's four years older than me, and man, we just had a lot of disunity, right? You guys have experienced that. But I was the little 12-year-old who was bothering the 16-year-old. 
right? And my mom and dad would send me with Naomi to go chaperone with her friends to go places because it was with some, some other guys, and I was a little bothersome 12-year-old. And we just constantly fought, and, and I firmly believe that the Lord is paying me back <laughs> with my children. <laughs> it's just, you reap what you sow. And so, but I just want you to know something. Me and my sister and me and my other siblings, when, 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 when we fought, we, it was brotherly. It was sibling rivalry and fighting. But you say something bad about them? You say something bad about my brother, my sister, my mom, my dad. I may have problems with them, but you talk bad about them. You better watch out. That's my brother. That's my sister. And that's what Paul is talking about. You love one another with brotherly affection. You may get on my nerves, and I may get on your nerves from time to time. But hey, when times get tough, we fight for one another. We love each other like we love our family. Amen? Love one another with brotherly affection. Amen. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice. This is so good. This is what we do as a church. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. That's how I feel on Monday mornings when I read those prayer requests. We weep with those who weep. We live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the, with the, the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible... As far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, believers, Christians, family, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. I will repay, says, says the Lord. Amen. So, I want to encourage you. We have a precious unity a sacred unity to fight for. So if there's a vision amongst you right now in this body and someone's sitting over here because they don't want to sit over here because you don't want to be close to each other, may that not be so. And may you reconcile today. May you take this time, the end of this service, to reconcile, to make things right. Don't go, don't go another day. S talk to each other. Send a text. If they're not here, call them after this service. Send a text message. Say, I love you too much to let this linger. The third thing that we see in this text is that in Christ, we can come with boldness to the Father. In Christ, we can come with boldness to the Father. So we have access to the peace of God in Christ, and the, the wall of hostility is broken down as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as a result of that, in Christ, we can come with boldness to the Father. That's what it says in Ephesians 2, 17 through 18. And he came, Christ came, and preached peace to you who were far off. And peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Did you hear that? In him. We both. Me. You. Everyone who names the name of Christ. We both have access in one spirit to the Father. That sounds like Hebrews chapter 4, doesn't it? Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. What is our confession? Jesus Christ and him crucified is our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. I love this verse. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This access that Hebrews 4 talks about, this access that Ephesians 2 talks about, this access to the Father provided by the Son and empowered by the Spirit is one of the greatest unifying aspects of our gathering as Christians. This ability that we have every time that we gather, whether we gather here on Sunday mornings or you gather for your life group, wherever you gather as believers, what a great 
What a great privilege and responsibility and sacred time that we have to gather together and to, to, and to do what? To draw near together to the throne of grace every single time we gather. It's a great unifying effect. There is power that is released when we take part in the spiritual blessing of unified worship and prayer. You guys remember the story of Peter and John at the Gate Beautiful? This is Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, Peter has preached first New Testament message, 3,000 people get saved. Peter and John are going to the temple, they're on their way, and there's a man by the gate beautiful outside of the temple, and he's been, he's been lame for years and years and years, and he's begging alms, he's asking for help. And so Peter and John walk up, and, and they, they, they look at him, and they tell him to look on, he said, look on me. And Peter says, look on me. And the guy asks for, for money like he always has done for years, and Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have I give unto you. Take up your bed, rise and walk. And the man got up and he walked and he was running and leaping and praising God and he was, he was overjoyed because of what happened and it caused a commotion. And, and, and the Pharisees who did not believe in Jesus, didn't believe in who he was, they were already trying to squelch the gospel of Jesus Christ and this testimony of his resurrection. But they were having trouble stopping these believers in Jesus because they were moving in miracles and power. And so they are had Peter and John arrested. And they put him in jail and they threatened them and they said, you better stop talking in this name. Because the more you talk in this name, the more things take place and the more people are going to follow you and not follow us. So they tried to threaten them. And they told them, when we release you, you better not speak any more in that name. Don't you think that would be a lot of pressure as believers in Jesus Christ? Can you imagine what that would be like? Let's just make this real. Let's just make it real, real life. Somebody comes and tells me next week, you better quit talking in that name. And they, they arrest me. They take me over to the police department downtown. And they say, if you keep talking in that name, we're going to arrest you and everyone else that's a part of your group. I mean, what would that be like? So Peter and John get released. And it would be like me coming back to you next Sunday. And I tell you, this is what happened. They, they arrested me. And they said, we got to qu quit preaching Jesus. They said, we have to stop. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'll show you what they did. Acts 4. When they were released, they went to their friends, to their family, friends and their family, and they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God. In unity. What did they do? They could have weeped and wailed and said, oh, God, why? Oh, God, why? Why is this happening? Why us? Why? Why this persecution? Why this strife? Why this pressure? But they lifted their voice in unity. And I'm telling you, there is a power that is released when brothers and sisters unify together in prayer before God. This power is released. And look at it. It's right here. They lifted their voices together to God and said, sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to, 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 to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants, listen to this, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. What did they pray? We want to keep speaking. Reminds me of the Apostle Paul in prison in Philippians. He prays that, that the church would pray for him. He says, please pray for me. I'm in chains for the gospel's sake, and he didn't pray that they would, they didn't ask him to pray that he would be released from prison. He says, pray that I can be even more bold for the gospel. The reason I'm in chains, I pray that I would be even more bold to speak the gospel. 
while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Power is released through unified prayer. That is a spiritual blessing that Paul is talking about here that we have. We have the spiritual blessing of, of unity and power can be released when we come together to pray and to worship. We have something truly special and truly sacred. May we never take it lightly. We have the blessing of being unified together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And many people today, they're giving up on the church. In an age of digital church, and live streams and podcasts and apps, many people are forfeiting the blessings that come from gathering together with like-minded believers. So what might God do in our church if we fight for unity? What might God do? And we unify together in prayer. What might God do in our church? What might God do in the marriages of our church when we gather together on Wednesday night? What might God do? Maybe there's going to be a couple that comes in there and they have thought there's no hope left. There's no hope left. It, it, I, I, there's no hope for reconciliation. What might God do when we unify together and power is released? What might God do in our church when our lost loved ones that we pray for week in and week out get saved? What, God, God, God can reach them. What might God do when we gather together in prayer in our community and our surrounding areas? I don't know what he's going to do. I have no idea what the future holds. But one thing I do know, one thing I do know, that without God's blessing, there's no hope. And the way that we receive God's blessing is to follow what he has established. So brothers and sisters, family of God at Living Word Church, we must do this. We must fight for unity. We must unify together in prayer. We must seek the Lord every single Sunday that we come. And on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays, seek the Lord in prayer and in worship. And when we, when we gather together, come in next Sunday with a sense of anticipation and expectation that, God, what might you do today? What are you going to do? I know this is just another Sunday. I know that this is just another time. I'm honoring you. I'm coming. But God... I see in your word that when your brothers and sisters unify together, things happen. And that's what I'm believing for. Are you believing God for that? Yes. Whose life will be transformed next? Can't wait to see. Whose marriage will be healed? Can't wait to see it. Psalms 133, as we close, why don't you stand to your feet with me? Psalms 133, 1 through 3 says this, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. What does God's word say in Psalms about unity? It says that it's good and pleasant. It says that it's precious. And it says it's like dew. It's refreshing. It's good. It's pleasant. It's pleasant. And it's refreshing. And I want to pray this morning that we would be unified. We would experience this good and pleasant and precious and refreshing unity as brothers and sisters in Christ. So here's what I want us to do. I love what Dr. Bud said. There's power in the prayer of agreement. So I want us to agree. And I know we can agree internally with each other, and my heart can be connected with your heart and all of that, but we're going to do it just an old school church thing. We're going we're gonna to hold hands. I know there's lots of germs all around, and you just use hand sanitizer when you leave. We'll be okay. It's not flu season, but let's all hold hands. I want everyone, if we can hold hands, I'm going to come down and hold hands with my wife. So all, are you guys all holding hands? I'm looking at you. All right, here we go. And I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing on our church. And I'm going to pray a prayer of unity for our church. And I'm going to pray a prayer that God would do miracles in our midst. That he would take this church to new levels, to new heights. That he would do new things in us. You guys ready? 
God, we unify together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We link arms, we hold hands, and we submit ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to you. That's the first step, God. We humble ourselves before you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we acknowledge that without your blessing, God, we can't move forward. Without your blessing, nothing good comes. So, Lord, we ask for your blessing and for your power. Lord, help us to obey you. Help us to be pleasing in our life before you. May we walk in holiness and purity. May we obey your word. When you say yes, we say yes. When you say no in your word, we say no. Lord, may we have clean hands and pure hearts as we worship you together. God, we need your blessing. We are desperate for your blessing. And God, I pray for unity amongst your church, at Living Word Church. I pray, Lord, that if there's a fence that anyone has against each other, God, I pray that there would be reconciliation. I pray that none of us would, would live any longer in, in offense or unforgiveness towards each other. I pray that we would forgive and let go and reconcile. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would do wonders in our midst. I pray and agree with my brothers and sisters that you would do wonders in our, in our midst, that you would do miracles, that you would save the lost, that you would heal marriages, that you would, that you would save those that we believe are too far gone. God, nothing is too hard for you. God, move in our church, move in our midst. Bring us together like never before. And God, may it all be done for the purpose of glorifying your name on the earth to exalt Christ, to make disciples, to equip the saints. That's why we exist. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everyone shouts, amen. I was once saving, so you came.